right, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. Uh, it would be great if just a couple of you in the chat box could let me know if you can hear me clearly. That would be wonderful. And, uh, and we'll roll into our, our webinar here today. All right, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of the AgriLinks team and the USAID Bureau for Food Security, I would like to welcome you to the November AgriLinks webinar on Strengthening Civil Society's Role in Development, a Partner's Perspective. I think this is a topic uh, that is relevant to nearly everyone who works in international development, so I'm excited for some great conversation uh, today on the webinar. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the Bureau for Food Security. And if you've attended an AgriLinks webinar before, you've probably heard my voice. Uh, I'll be facilitating the event uh, this morning. So before we get started with the content, I would like to provide a few reminders. Uh, first, the chat box is your main way to communicate today, and I can see that a few people are taking advantage of that. That's great. Please do um, use it liberally to introduce yourself, let us know where you're joining from, your org, uh, to network, to share resources. It looks like we have a bit of a small crowd today, but that can be great for engagement, um, for everyone you know, talking, chatting, asking questions. So please don't hesitate uh, to ask questions at any point and to use the chat box. Um, let's see. We'll be holding um, many of the questions until the end, but we'll also, um, if anything really important comes up along the way, we'll, we'll see if we can answer it along the way. And we'll also have our experts um, typing into the chat box uh, along the way to help answer your questions. Uh, we are recording this webinar, and we'll post the recording, the transcript, and the other resources to AgriLinks. Um, and if you're watching the webinar right now, that means you're already on the email list to receive a link to the recording. So you can watch any parts you missed or share it with your colleagues. And you'll also see some key links and file downloads on the left of your screen. Uh, those will point you to the handbook that will be in uh, question today, and uh, a few other um, key resources that um, We'll, we're encouraging you to download. OK, so I think it's time to dive into the content. So I'm going to introduce our speakers up front. Um, so I'll, I'll click through and show you their bios as I move along. Uh, to introduce uh, the, the topic and uh, kind of the material today, we will have Susan Pologrudo with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And she is our advisor on civil society and local engagement and spearheaded the development of the Civil Society Engagement Handbook. So we're excited to have her uh, as our first speaker. We'll also have Carolyn Barker Siena, yes, excellent, um, who is with Lutheran World Relief and has been there quite a, a while, a decade, serving as the Senior Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, and then next up, uh, we'll have Stan Lake Casaboni uh, with World Vision, who is World Vision's Business Development and Quality Assurance Director and in Tanzania. We will also have, let's see, oh, oh, Sue Kent with World Vision, who is technical advisor to World Vision's social accountability programs. Um, so she'll be up at that point. And then also Sarah Nitz with Interaction, the policy and advocacy manager for food security and agriculture. So this is a really great lineup. I'm excited to um, dive into the content. And I'll pass the mic over to Susan Pologrudo. Great. Thank you so much, Julie, for that introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody who has joined us today. I am Susan Pallagrudo. I'm with the Bureau for Food Security here in USAID, and I'm going to do a very brief and quick overview of how we've been engaging civil society and why and how we've gotten to the point where we are today into the introduction of the handbook. So you're going to hear from me. And Sarah's going to help me with that, because Interaction and some of our implementing partners and the civil society organizations here in DC have been a very key component as well as um, collaborators in that process. So as some of you may recall, Hillary Clinton gave an impassioned speech at the UN to focus more on a collaborative effort to engage local actors and civil society in our food security and nutrition efforts in 2012. And soon thereafter, our former administrator, Raj Shah, asked the Advisory Committee for Voluntary Foreign Aid to launch a specialized working group focused specifically on Feed the Future 
and our ways of engaging civil society and how we can promote collaboration. So this was the beginning of some of the very specific efforts to have a more specific and targeted approach. And as many of you um, who have worked, if you have any experience working in this space, also know around the same time, and probably now for a decade now, we've seen uh, an increase in closing spaces. So closing spaces is a term that we use for closing spaces for civil society, for voice, for their activism. So that has been also the backdrop and the context for things we've been seeing and experiencing. So the advisory group for voluntary foreign aid soon formed, and they made very specific recommendations and a report that was submitted in September of 2013. That report had really specifics for how USAID in particular can be working internally to support staff, to have um, trainings, as well as things we can do to, to promote more conversation and learning among ourselves. And one of those specific things was the development of an action plan, which we did in 2014. Um, and around also some of the some of more of that same backdrop, the stand with civil society almost in that same month that that recommendations report was submitted from the advisory group, um, we had the stand for civil society that was also issued. It was a presidential memorandum focusing on the important role that civil society plays in shaping our lives. And that is an interesting document because it really directed all U.S. government personnel and staff to really consult with civil society organizations to seek their feedback, to focus on how we can collaborate more um, intentionally together. So that is also some of the backdrop and also one of the specific deliverables around that time. So after we had the stand with civil society and after we had the civil society action plan, um, we had, sorry, okay, I'm back on track. So I'm going to wrap this up here. So with the civil society action plan, just to, to emphasize, we had just a couple of main objectives, and again, this is your brief overview, and one was enhancing the civil society engagement, and the second piece was our messaging with our communications team. So those were our big pieces for our deliverables. And now we're moving into another deliverable that was part of this action plan, but separate. And that deliverable was focusing more on the engagement. And this document was just released in the spring, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So it is focusing on more specifically not just how we can work together as a team and as an agency and with our partners, but this one's more about, well, what have we learned? Um, the engagement handbook, some of our best practices or even ideas for just, just how we want to go about working together and in particular with local actors. So I'm about to hand it over to Sarah right now. So she's going to talk about the genesis of these two documents and how we've collaborated together and what that process has looked like and taking it from the ACFA and the working group and interactions role. So thank you, Sarah. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes, thank you, Susan, um, for that introduction and that great overview. Um, so interaction is an alliance of 190 plus uh, U.S.-based humanitarian and development organizations. And we've been engaged in this civil society through, with the Defeat the Future process really from the beginning in a consultation with USAID, with ACFA. Um, we developed a policy brief in 2011 to help kind of guide or help bring perspectives from our organizations um, on what we'd like to see and how we'd like to uh, have civil society uh, be better, in, better engaged in the future. Um, so this is kind of a couple of the key points that we hit, as you see on your slide, um, in that brief um, that we wanted really that have also been echoed in the final document, which was really um, great to see. Uh, if, so that's kind of, I don't want to go through all the different points on that, but uh, that's the, the key area there. Um, then that transitioned after we worked that brief and working with ACFA, 
but transitioned into the Strengthening Civil Society Roles and Development Handbook uh, and hit three key areas of, uh, areas of practice. Uh, first was we wanted to, the goal of promoting aid effectiveness principles and norms. The second is providing a guiding framework for development effectiveness and stakeholder consultation. And then that um, manifested itself in four engagement principles that were selected and um, came from a little bit from the interactions policy brief. So we're going to walk through kind of the four uh, engagement practices that are included in the handbook. Um, if you have the document, you can kind of follow along as we walk through them. First is uh, the engagement practice of meaningful participation. Um, where local and civil society and other stakeholders should participate meaningfully and help shape development priorities and strategies. From interactions perspective, this really is an idea that civil society should be engaged from the beginning, not as an afterthought, and really should uh, help emphasize um, throughout the entire process of program planning. Um, if you see through all of these different spaces, all these different um, engagement practices, there's additional resources in the back in the handbook that you can look at uh, to help facilitate these kind of discussions. The second practice uh, that it was highlighted is uh, the whole of society development um, and local ownership should be based on a multi-stakeholder whole of society approach. That it should not just be working directly with in, um, implementing partners, but really working with everyone uh, in the community so you can get a variety of perspectives and a variety of approaches, and that really helps make a robust conversation. And um, for engagement practice two, uh, Lutheran World Relief uh, will really help discuss that area a little bit further um, in their portion of the project. Of the um, next, in engagement practice three, it's about uh, the enabling environment and creating an enabling environment and operating space for civil society and other non-state actors that should facilitate their participation in development. Um, there's some really wonderful examples um, that you can look in the handbook from uh, Burma or Tajikistan that really help highlight how this uh, looks in practice. Um, and I think that was the goal of this uh, handbook was to provide not only overall overarching pr practices and engagement principles, but um, highlighting how this can actually be used in the field. Um, and then the last one is engagement practice four, which is capacity strengthening. Um, civil society engagement and participation may require strengthening organizations' capacity to be effective and sustainable. Um, again, this is a really key one for, from interactions perspective. Um, before anything happens, you have you have to understand uh, the capacity of the people that you're working with and work with them prior to a program to help bring them to the level um, that they can be most effective and engaged in a program or a process, um, that they can really have that engagement in the strategy from the beginning, that you're all talking in the same terms, you're all engaged in the same way, um, and that you really create that relationship that can help make programs and projects sustainable um, beyond, uh, the, beyond the initial uh, implementation. And I am now going to hand it back uh, to Susan uh, to kind of wrap up on the overarching and background space uh, before we head into the rest of our presenters. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> so that was a great overview of our handbook. Thank you so much. That was a great overview of our handbook. Um, the four specific engagement practices or best practices that we're focusing on, and you're going to hear, as she mentioned, uh, two from two more specifically. This handbook is really serving as a guide to put the U.S. government and USAID's vision of country ownership and local ownership into practice. That's why we created it, and that's why we're having this uh, webinar today. It also builds upon our Global Food Security Act of 2016, as well as our own global food security strategy that we developed last year that is emphasizing the local ownership and partnerships to improve sustainability. It is also very much related to systems thinking. 
systems thinking is really um, systems thinking is one of the things we've been focusing on at USAID for a number of years now, and we have the local systems framework paper as well as the five R's and a number of other resources that are public publicly available. But basically, systems thinking is really an integrated approach to sustainability. It's refocusing our efforts around what we used to call local solutions five plus years ago to more of a local systems framework, more of a systems thinking approach. And as we move forward, we want to increasingly play a convening role to bring local and international partners together around a specific development challenge or problem we're trying to address. We also want to connect the partnerships and the people and the players to address these challenges and problems together. And then we want to catalyze and scale up the solutions that these partnerships produce. So that's, again, just some more framing for how it's related to some of the agency's bigger picture policies and how we can work into civil society together. So without any further ado, I am going to turn it over to Carolyn so she can then give you some more specific information about Lutheran World Relief Project. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, very much. I want to thank you not only for inviting Lutheran World Relief to participate in this webinar, but also to participate in the Civil Society Engagement Handbook. Um, so we have my slides up. There we go. Great. Okay. Um, so as Sarah had mentioned um, in the handbook, it highlights four different um, engagement practices. And the case study that I'm going to be presenting focuses primarily on the second engagement practice of whole of society development. However, I would say that this um, project that I'll be presenting actually touches on all four of the engagement practices, because um, really you need to have all four to be most effective. Um, the particular project I'll be talking about is called Gender and Agriculture from Policy to Practice, or we also call it GAP. Um, this project was funded by USAID through the Bureau for Food Security, um, Feed the Future, and uh, it was actually a program called Innova Innovations for Gender Equity, an APS that went out, I believe, in 2011. So the project is very much focused on um, gender approaches to food security. Um, move on. The, I keep pushing the wrong button. <laughs> okay. All right. So I'm going to just briefly explain the approach. First of all, um, this project took place between October 2013 and July of 2016. So it did end about a little over a year ago now. Um, and it took place in Honduras, in the western part of Honduras, um, in the Department of Lempira, in 10 different municipalities of uh, Lempira. Um, the approach that we took to this, this was very much of a, a pilot project, again, under the this Innovations for Gender Equity program. And the approach we took to it was um, not only to focus on the role of um, women in terms of their involvement in civil society, um, but also to pull in the role to pull in men, and to recognize that men have a key role in terms of both supporting women's leadership, but also you have been muted for more policies um, that promote gender. Your microphone policy. has been turned so on. That was really kind of the the basis of this programming, but at the same time, the idea being that we really wanted to focus on the development of a locally driven gender equality agenda. And I think we all are very familiar with the fact that to achieve food security goals, gender equity is a key driver for um, food security. So that's really, again, at the basis of this project approach, pulling together both men and women again, to advocate for policies um, that will ultimately reduce gender gaps. I wanted to highlight in, in the context of um, Honduras, there were um, several policies that we were able to build on um, that were already in existence. Um, 
specifically three laws that were in place. One related to um, the law of equity for opportunities for women, um, which led to the National Plan for Gender Equity. A second law was the law of food security and nutrition. Interestingly, though, in Honduras, that law for food security and nutrition did not highlight the role of women or gender particularly. And then thirdly, the law of municipalities. And this law was particularly important for, um, <laughs> this law was particularly important for uh, the implementation of this project because it required that at least a minimum 5% of the municipality's budgets needed to go towards um, women's activities. So essentially the idea being access to, for women to resources um, for economic um, activities in particular. Having said that, despite the fact that these three laws existed, as we all know, there is often a gap between policy and practice. Um, so a lot of what we were trying to do was bridge that gap and help women's groups to further um, take advantage of these laws um, to promote their access to resources. Now I'm going to go on and talk a little bit about some of the results that we saw from this project. You can see here that we had over 4,000 direct beneficiaries. Um, and the breakdown below shows that the majority of those beneficiaries were women. So again, the idea being um, promoting the, the involvement of women in advocating for their rights and access to resources. But we also had quite a few men who were involved. And this is because, as I mentioned in the last slide, a big part of the approach was this, what we refer to as the masculinities approach. So not only were women being trained in leadership skills, but men were also being trained in sort of gender equity awareness, um, awareness of different roles that men and women play in their community, et cetera. So ultimately what we were looking for are structural changes, both from the political side, but also from the cultural side, recognizing that you can't change policies and implementation of policies without changing sort of the, the cultural approach. And I think this kind of also goes a little bit to the systems approach that um, Susan was talking about. But here we talk a lot about the need for structural change and, and also the need for having agents of change. So th both these women and men who were trained we saw as agents of change within their communities. Okay. So a couple of um, sort of concrete results from the project. The, women's, the women that were trained, they were part of what we refer to as women's networks, women's municipal networks. Um, and these municipal networks had already been formed previous to the project. So we were working within these existing groups to further strengthen the capacity of the women members to be able to, again, advocate for resources. And a lot of this was leadership training, but it was also very practical training around how to design a project to present to municipal governments for support out of um, that 5% of funding that I mentioned earlier. Um, due to all of that training, they were able to put together a variety of um, project proposals. And ultimately, we had 170 projects that were supported by municipal governments representing close to $70,000 worth of disbursements from those local governments for these 170 projects. I think what's interesting is to see that breakdown is that um, of those projects, even though this was a food security sort of ag-focused project, the, the reality is that these women were not only looking for support um, for directly for ag projects, but also for non-agriculture, basically businesses. So we're talking about bakeries, we're talking about um, beekeeping on, as you can see in the photo, on the ag side, um, coffee nurseries, and a variety of small stores, kitchen gardens, a variety of different activities that women were engaged in. And I think the key piece here is the recognition that you have to listen to women as well and, and recognize that what we as an NGO or as USAID think should be their priorities are not necessarily always going to be the priorities. So again, here we were focused a lot on agriculture, but what came out of um, these proposals often was not necessarily agricultural focused. Okay. Um, so this slide, I'm missing a word in, in the first bullet, but this slide refers to rural savings and loan institutions. Um, we focus a lot on these rural savings, these 
sort of locally based rural savings and um, loans institutions because they're the ones who provide access to credit for women. So again, this is another way in addition to um, accessing resources from the municipal governments, we wanted women to have more access to credit from these um, local rural savings and loans institutions. Um, and as you can see, there were 56 um, of, I think they were in a total of 60 um, savings and loans institutions that did um, change some of their, their uh, policies around accessing, providing more access to, to women and some of the ways that they did that, let's go to my notes here, um, were by um, reducing the annual membership fees that had to be paid by women. Um, they often gave women extensions um, for their payment plans, um, they, for their meetings of the, of the um, local, of the rural savings and loans institutions. They ensured that there was flexible meeting time so that they could respond to when women were available to participate. Um, they had, some had credit lines exclusively for women, et cetera. So ultimately that led to an increase in credit availability for, for women. And then I wanted to highlight that nine of the ten um, municipalities that we worked with in Western Honduras did um, integrate into their policies, um, their food and, security, food and nutrition policies, a gender approach. So I mentioned this in, the earlier, in an earlier slide that while there was this food and nutrition um, law, it did not highlight the role of gender in that. And so as part of the advocacy efforts, um, we were able to influence um, and advocate for more of a gender approach within the, the policies of these nine different municipalities. There was one municipality that ultimately um, was very difficult to work with and that um, had a lawyer, sorry, not a lawyer, <laughs> a mayor who was not open um, to the project as much as the other uh, municipalities had been. So lastly, I just wanted to highlight that in this entire approach, we, I mentioned earlier that this is really a pilot project to sort of test out this um, innovative approach by bringing together men and women. And we um, documented that approach in a toolkit that can be found at this link, genderinagriculture.org. Um, so I welcome all of you to take a look at that because it goes into much more detail than I have time to describe um, today in this, in this webinar. I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. So now we're going to uh, turn it over to Sue, who's on the phone. Sue, if you're on mute, now would be a great time to unmute yourself. on the global food security strategy as Susan did. I want to reinforce effective governance. I mean, system strengthening within that is very important and that the strategy recognises that to have effective governance requires capacity for dialogue between citizens, government and the private sector. And there are many terms to, that, that describe this um, and this is obviously the work of, the, of what's being promoted through the Civil Society Handbook. There are many terms to describe this mutual accountability, bottom-up accountability, demand-led governance and social accountability which is the term that I will use today. Uh, so what are the elements of social accountability? Uh, well there are three key elements that make up these social accountability interventions. Civic information, the right to information, collective action and government response. And if you remember nothing from this presentation, I fervently hope that you remember these three key elements. Because when communities are empowered with knowledge about their specific rights to services, and we're talking very, very tangible knowledge here, they have the confidence to speak up on their experiences with those services. And in speaking up and sharing on that experience and providing that feedback, it helps government to do a better job by responding in a more appropriate and efficient way. So I'm talking broadly to World Vision's social accountability approach because we've, we've developed uh, this over 12 years of research 
an application now with Oxford, Columbia, John Hopkins and Georgetown universities among others through systematic reviews, randomised control trials, quasi-experimental designs, more than two dozen evaluations. We have hard evidence of its impact and we've scaled to more than 400 programs across health, water and sanitation, education, food security and livelihoods in 48 countries. As I said, we're talking about proven efficacy here and we're talking about the gold standard in evaluations. For example, a randomised control trial that led, was led by Oxford University found strong results in student test scores, reductions in student and teacher absenteeism and a similar intervention in health from a long run impact study found dramatic results in uh, redu reductions in child mortality. But what I'd really like to draw people's attention to is a very significant ev macro evaluation that was done by DFID this year and which shows, and I quote, compelling evidence of social accountability programs which, and I quote, almost <coughs> always impacted services. And next week, USAID's global health team will deliver a major review of evidence in health which will also touch on this on this evidence in health. So how does this social accountability work? Well this is from researchers at Columbia University, their descript description of what they saw in the process and we're, st we're talking about improved citizen knowledge of specific entitlements as I mentioned to services which enable citizens to have a dialogue with government. I mean that information is really super critical in order that, that communities can talk with government. The development of action plans which are agreed publicly with community service providers and government uh, officials is really a critical part of the approach that enables the, the monitoring of improvements in, serv in services and the holding of governments to account. A little bit more on the detail because Susan was quite keen on the how of this being, of, of how we implement this. And a lot of you will have heard of community services scorecards. I'm just talking through some of the participatory approaches that we use in, in World Vision and many other uh, NGOs also use uh, scorecards. So this is an, an empowerment process. Uh, what you see are four interlinked participatory processes. An initial meeting for everyone to understand the process and what we call monitoring standards or a social audit which put simply is the government standard for a particular service a government commits to in its policy and technical documents. So for example, uh, maybe the number of extension workers per administrative area, what functions those extension workers are meant to carry out, including how often they should be in the field supporting farmers. And then we have scorecards which allow communities to come up with their own priorities for services and we've seen in the case of Tanzanian farmers, which my colleague Stan Lake will shortly talk to, uh, it's, it's there around access to land tenure which we need government services to facilitate. In Rwanda and Uganda, it's been improved quality and timely delivery of seed and fertiliser. The information about farmer priorities uh, and the needs and gaps and constraints in government meeting service standards are then shared in an interface meeting, uh, which is where an action plan is jointly developed between farmers, agricultural extension workers and key government decision makers. And I'll, I'll shortly show you an image of one of these meetings that we had in Bangladesh. So just briefly talking to one of our programs in, in Bangladesh is a large program, a uh, USAID program uh, reaching more than 850,000 beneficiaries. Uh, here is uh, uh, an inter uh, image of an action plan or interface meeting we call between service users and providers of a health clinic in the COPE in southwest Bangladesh. All these participatory activities that I've mentioned before in the civic education particularly uh, that culminate in the meeting that you see here where service users and providers and key decision makers all attend. So I identified earlier the, the three core elements of social accountability which I'll again reinforce information, collective action and government response. And what you see here I want to illustrate is at the very, well I hope you can see, <laughs> at the very uh, front of the room the person speaking is actually the chairman of the union parish who's the head of the local government there 
and he's committing to the community, this particular community, uh, about their particular health clinic that he will make sure, he will ensure that water access is made avail available in their local clinic. Now this is water that is, is already promised and committed under the Rural Health Clinic policy there. Again, this is information about that policy that has been broadly shared as part of the civic education process. And I just want to stress that the local media were there to record the commitment and many bureaucrats. So some of the outcomes we are seeing are increased uh, community knowledge and action, service provider knowledge, action, ownership and improved local leadership are some of the key components. Uh, I briefly talked to this but uh, the systematic review that we had uh, done of our and others work. Uh, we're seeing the results along the lines of, of these tri key triggers for change in Bangladesh. So for example, one of the very key mechanisms uh, which is described by the researchers is, is, is that the way this, this, these approaches work is to allow communities to act as the eyes and the ears. In their, in their communities and that acts as a trigger or an incentive or sanction for government to act. And it's these processes of civic information providing the skills and confidence to citizens to monitor their, their government's performance. So by way of example in Bangladesh we've already seen where they have information on when the health clinic should be opened and closed, what drugs should be available, that community members are already starting to monitor these, the staff attendance and the drug availability and we are seeing more organised and proactive local leaders galvanising their communities into action. So on to the top takeaways. Uh, I just want to reinforce that social accountability is key to improving governance which as we mentioned earlier is uh, effective governance is an is a, is a important part of the global food strategy uh, and for agricultural systems transformation. Information is power. I think I've probably emphasised this quite through, a lot throughout but I, I can't emphasise enough that communities must have access to civic education, well targeted, tangible quality and relevant information in order to be able to engage with the governments. And there are many uh, social accountability activities uh, that work but in particular we know the evidence around score scorecards, social audits and participatory budgeting which I may not have already mentioned are, are, are very important. Now while the evidence is well established in education and health, we are still learning and collecting on uh, about information about how it works in food security, agriculture and livelihoods but the results are very promising. However, I just add that we're, we're talking about governance across all of these sectors and that governance and improved governance is obviously really critical to sustainability. Thank you. Great, thank you so much Sue for that great presentation. Um, and now we're going to hand it over to Stanlick. He also works at World Vision and he is based in Tanzania and he's going to talk about the empowered world view. Stanlick, are you on the phone? Uh, thank you so much. Um, hi everyone. I uh, was just following up on uh, uh, Sue's great presentation. I'm going to focus more on a project um, that we've been implementing here in Tanzania. Uh, in front of you, um, the slide captures uh, the highlights of this project. It's called the Babati Pamoja Project. Uh, it's transforming households' resilience in vulnerable environments. Uh, the location is Babati. It's a semi-arid and arid area. We're targeting 9,000 smallholder farmers. The project uh, commenced in 2013 and is scheduled to end uh, in 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Right, so one of the things that this project is focusing on um, through the empowering Capitalize, Catalyzing and Mindset Transformation through Empowered Worldview. Uh, next slide. I, I don't have control for my slides. Right. That's okay, Stanley, so I'm just going to interrupt before you get too far. Some of you have reviewed uh, the Slendon Civil Society Role in Development, uh, the, uh, the Handbook for Engagement. Uh, you realize that uh, 
this project was highlighted, that was a few years ago. So the focus of that project, of the project is Empowered Worldview uh, with Citizen Voice and Action, uh, Sue, which Sue has just presented, uh, Community Management of Natural Resources, using Empowered Worldview uh, with Citizen Voice and Action uh, to, as a vehicle to bring people together to increase social accountability. Next slide. So when, in 2013, when the project started, um, for many of you who might know or who are aware, land tenure is a big issue in Africa. So the land tenure system in Tanzania is not favorable towards private land ownership. Land is owned by the state. The second issue that the project realized was, uh, as a result of one, there's increased escalating land pressure. The growing population coupled with uh, depletion of soil has resulted in um, land tenure. This is also linked to point number one. Uh, because of unclear land tenure system, land is communally owned and shared, so there's really no one uh, looking after the land. Now, with those two uh, factors that I've just mentioned, um, we're starting to see a lot of uh, land conflict increasing. In this project site, we have different uh, sections of the community that use the land differently. We have agro-pastoralists, we have pastoralists. Agro-pastoralists basically farm the land, while the pastoralists focus on grazing land. Another va variable uh, within the project site is this site is surrounded by uh, famous national parks. Now, when you add climate change plus wildlife migration, corridors that where animals used to, which animals used to use to move to migrate from uh, one area to another area, have been invaded. So this is also bringing another uh, new conflict into the di uh, into the mix. So. Now we have uh, human conflict, but also human and animal conflict. Next slide. So what did we do? Um, the journey itself. As Sue explained, one of the critical ingredients of our citizen voice and action, we did this through what we, uh, what we termed as empowered worldview. Sensitization and awareness raising is fundamental. This allows for proper buy-in. The second thing that we did was to mobilize smallholder farmers so that they could develop an understanding of what it is, that they, what, what, uh, so that they could envision uh, a different way of doing business, but also to create structures for effective engagement. The third thing that we did after we had organized um, or mobilized the farmers was now to engage the appropriate stakeholders. In this case, these were the duty bearers. This was done through systematic engagement, but before that, we drew a game, drew a game plan. It was important for us to make sure that any engagement that we did was uh, viewed in positive light. So the engagement was more or less dialogue. We brought in the duty bearers as part of the solution and also made sure that they understood that this was a win-win situation. So we co-created action plans with the duty bearers. So part of the achievements, next slide, the achievements. The, this, many of the achievements that I'm going to describe here are at first in the location and in many parts in Tanzania. Through this, uh, through the things that I've just described, after two years, the project managed to, one, organize six land use committees. These are registered committees. Two, six land use plans and bylaws were approved by local and national government authorities. Number three, 270 certificates of customary right of occupancy were issued. That means they have some form of title deed or a claim to land. 76 watershed beacons were established. And also, since this project commenced, we have not um, encountered any new land conflict within that location. 
understand as a result of that, we've also witnessed that one pasture corridor management plan was established, so no conflict between um, pastoralists and agro-pastoralists. Next slide. So the main, the main uh, or top takeaways. Recently, in April, technical assistance to NGOs Tango conducted a midline study. This study demonstrated that there is strong This was his last slide, so we're in good shape here. And um, perhaps while we're getting him back, we can ask a question that has come in. Thank you all for posting your questions and for having some interesting discussion in the chat box. We, we definitely appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, right, we've got our questions over here in a kind of a side window that the presenters can see. We've been collecting them throughout um, the event, and so perhaps we should just I'll jump back a little bit to when uh, Sarah was speaking, and uh, Sophie Thies asked, in what ways have you found that capacity strengthening can go both ways between civil society organizations and donors or implementers? I'm not entirely sure what she means by can go both ways, so maybe if you could yeah, that too. I think actually um, that's a really key point, that civil capacity strengthening um, from interactions understanding and perspective and our discussions that we have um, is not only about capacity strengthening of civil society groups and local NGOs, but also um, capacity strengthening for local governments or donor implementers to how best respond and how to engage with local society, with local um, civil society groups and NGOs. And I think part of this handbook for engagement is to help with that capacity strengthening for uh, USAID and local implementers um, and donors so that there is that understanding and that there is that um, resource for people to look at and go to. Um, but I think it is key that you can't just focus on um, strengthening civil society. You also have to look at training and building capacity of local governments or other entities to best respond to civil society so that it can be a mutual and connected co uh, coordination between those two groups. Because if you just have civil society talking one direction, you're not going to have a productive movement forward. Very interesting. Yes. Have mm -hmm. like back yet, so we'll, we'll keep moving with our questions that have come in. And it looks like there was a uh, a clarifying question that came in from Indra Klein during Carolyn's presentation. With regard to loans provided to women, under your example, were they packaged differently? And I'm assuming she means loans provided to women versus men. Mm -hmm. um, so again, because this is a locally driven um, project, I wonder if I need to speak to this. Um, it was locally driven, so again, the idea was that we were working with the, the different rural savings and loans institutions and, and helping each one develop their own policies depending sort of on their, their context. And so yes, um, depending on those different um, sort of local policies, the, the loans were packaged differently. As I had mentioned earlier, um, there was an effort to really facilitate um, the access to credit by women. So the um, period of time that, that the women had to repay the loans tended to be longer because this was often the first time that they were getting um, a loan or getting credit. Um, the, the credit lines that were used were a little bit were structured differently as well for the women um, than they were for men. And again, just I think largely the idea was that they sort of tried to relax a little bit some of the requirements. And some of this refers back to what Dan Lick was talking about in terms of um, land ownership. As we all know, women tend to not have ownership of land, and so that limits their ability to access credit um, as compared to, to men. So again, there was a relaxation of the requirements um, needed for accessing the, the loans for women. I, I do want to mention again and highlight that um, in the, uh, the toolkit that I, I gave the 
the um, link to in my presentation on the last slide. There's a lot more in terms of um, lessons learned for each component of the project. So if you're interested in learning more about, particularly about the, the credit portion, there's a lot more information there, as including, um, Indra, I know you were asking a little bit about sort of storytelling, about what the impacts are of, I think that's what your question was referring to, and there, there are a lot of the success stories, but also the challenges um, that were faced by some of the women and men in the project implementation on that website. So I highly recommend that um, everyone mm -hmm. take a look at that. Great. Um, and if you want to be able to access that link, you can download the, uh, the presentation from today in the little file downloads box on the bottom left of your screen. Uh, that contained the link to the toolkit, and I believe it was also posted in the chat box by one of your colleagues. I mean, perhaps yeah. not. Um, we can also try and post that in the chat box again as well. But go ahead and download the slides. Uh, they'll also be available on AgriLinks. All right, so um, Sue, a few questions came in during your presentation, so I thought we would jump down to those. And um, Indra asked, with regard to community engagement, do you have any thoughts on reaching collective buy-in when considering cultural differences, village to village, region to region? Um, how, how do cultural differences affect the ability to get a collective buy-in from a, a, a community or a region? Yeah, it's a very good question and social and cultural inclusion is, is incredibly challenging even with this work where we try and have age, sex, ethnic disaggregated scorecards. I mean, uh, for example, in Nepal a few years ago when we were doing the work, we had separate uh, uh, groups for the women, the ethnic Taru women. So we're ensuring that their voice is also heard in the broader community meeting. But uh, I would acknowledge there, there are many challenges and we haven't looked, for example, to analyse necessarily how the, their contributions to those action plans might have been have been represented, um, and but what we do know is this is actually quite I'd say more of a cutting edge, uh, especially as we're looking at working in the, in fragile states and using this kind of work. And what the Columbia Columbia study did show is increases in social cohesion from this work. So there there are some benefits there, but um, certainly it's a it's a very challenging uh, area and uh, uh, it's it, there's certainly uh, a lot more work that can be done also around gender I would say in, in that specific area. I think more broadly we're doing this work in rural areas and it's very localised so you mentioned village, we're doing this at, at more of a village sub-national level so there tends to be, especially in rural areas, a more homogenous community. Um, unfortunately, if we'd had Stan Lake, we, we certainly might have been able to address some of the resource uh, conflict issues uh, in, that, in that case study in Tanzania. But we're definitely seeing a lot more diversity when we're trying to do this work in, in urban settings, and that is much more complex. Great. Thank you, Sue. And uh, a question also came in for you from Diana McLean, who asked, is local leadership compromised in this process by not being able to deliver on policies and investments when national or regional actors are not fulfilling plans? Yeah, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> there is actually uh, well documented uh, what we're starting to call local level accountability track, uh, uh, a trap, I should say, uh, in, this, in this space. But, and the cutting edge is really trying to work at aggravating citizen voice and representations at the national level to get policy enforcement. But I'd also like to say that obviously this, this work is, is, no, is not a silver bullet, but it's very significant we're finding in terms of contributions to subnational governance because there, there are often no platforms to bring local level leaders, be, it, be they traditional or elected, or bureaucrats together, and that's what this process is doing, which reinforces the value of all of those local uh, actors. I'd also say that resources are not always the issue. You know, there are bottlenecks in services uh, that are not about resources, and so bring this collaborative uh, uh, process uh, brings brings that out, and so we're seeing actions where we might not otherwise see them. 
Um, but I would share some of the really promising work we're seeing at the national level when we aggregate the citizen voice, and this will go a little bit to the technology question because World Vision's now got a database where we're aggregating our work across um, um, some thousands now of uh, uh, service points. Um, I'd like to share this example in, in Uganda just to, to, to highlight how we can break through this, this local level accountability trap. In, in Uganda, we had a situation where citizen voice was aggregated across several districts from this work and in a joint uh, NGO coalition, uh, there was uh, an intense campaign which led to pressure on the parliamentarians who then blocked that year's budget 2012-13 uh, to in ensure an, an increased allocation of $19 million for more than 6,000 health workers. So we can really uh, aggregate this work and, and push the, 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 the resource question up to the national level. It is possible and there's a lot of work being done in particular by uh, Jonathan Fox at American University uh, on how we can bring together this citizen monitoring and policy monitoring to have much greater impact at the governance level. Great, thank you so much, Sue. Um, all right, we have a few more questions to get through. And Indra, we see a question just came in from you, but I'm not entirely sure what you mean by tagline. So if you wouldn't mind um, perhaps just elaborating a tiny bit on that question, that would be great. Um, but we have another question that came in a bit earlier from Indra about how are large companies and stakeholders being engaged to help bring down costs to ex execute programs? as well as secure long-term commitment to continue progress? Quite a big question, I think. Um, it came in kind of broadly to all of these speakers, so um, I'm not sure who would like to jump in on that one. I've got an example I can share in DRC, but it's certainly a, a whole new and very large and complicated area working with the private sector but we've had some success with TFM in terms of doing social accountability for extractive, in the extractive industries where we've brought communities together with TFM and the government uh, to ensure that TFM actually um, provides services to those communities and so we have seen some success there. Yeah, and um, this is Sarah from Interaction. Uh, I know from kind of consultations and conversations about Feed the Future 2.0 and moving forward, um, that public-private partnerships is a key focus of theirs about how best to engage not only USAID but also the continuum of U.S. government assistance um, with, and connecting uh, with commerce or with uh, whether it's different trade organizations so that there is that continuum and sustainability of programming with um, private and consultation and different and larger stakeholders as well. Excellent, thank you. And I don't believe we have Stan Lake back on or or do we, Adam? Or I think we do. Uh, Stan Lake, if you're there, um, let us know. Not hearing your voice at the moment. Um, all right. I'm so back. Thanks. Oh you are, excellent. Yes. <laughs> Um, well, we had a question come in about um, did your study address insurance and if any changes resulted. So if you could address that. And then also if you'd like to make any final points that you weren't able to make uh, when, when you got caught up, um, we'd be welcome those as well. Um, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, just to recap uh, what I was um, about to present on the last slide. So some of the issues that um, technical assistance to NGOs, Tango was able to demonstrate to us, to attribute to, towards uh, Empowered World View and Citizen Voice and Action, uh, where in this location, the vibrant, the smallholder farming sector has become more vibrant, new and increasingly organized agricultural value chains, uh, decreasing vulnerability communities were able to bounce back after a drought without external support, uh, which demonstrate that uh, communities are now better organized, uh, improving um, livelihood outcomes, uh, 
project beneficiaries uh, had more income, about $58 higher monthly income compared to the control group. And also policies, institutions, processes, uh, communities and local government authorities are starting to formalize and enforce natural resource governance and are putting in place a progressive land tenure. So these are some of the things that, we're, that are emerging. Uh, also remember that this uh, evaluation is of the period of uh, halfway. That's about two and a half years after the project uh, had started. So we believe that there's going to be more, uh, more impactful, more results that are, that are going to demonstrate that um, citizen voice and action can do a whole lot more across a range of uh, interventions. The one that we mentioned is around natural resources. We have other things that we're looking at, at value chains. We have other things that we have also, which we're using around disaster risk reduction. So we're pretty confident that the emerging results will, uh, will filter through to other sectors. With regards to uh, the question that was asked, insurance, I'm not pretty sure if I'm responding to it correctly. Um, once you have title deeds, uh, the local title deeds, that in itself uh, gives you ac um, access to to be able to actually borrow against that land. So you can access uh, loans from banks. You can also um, list it out so you can actually get income from that land. Um, maybe if the person who posed that question, if they can clarify exactly what it is that they meant. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Danek. As all of you can see, uh, we have some polls on the screen, which we would greatly appreciate your input on uh, to let us know what topics you would like to see in upcoming AgriLinks webinars. Um, let us know if you found this useful and can apply it to your work. And of course, um, let me just know if you'd like to join the AgriLinks mailing list or have any suggestions on how we can improve future webinars. These types of suggestions are, are very, very helpful to us. All right, um, we've tackled pretty much all of the questions coming in today. If anyone has any final questions, speak now uh, or, or hold your peace. Although we're always happy to um, continue the conversation and engagement around um, society and the handbook and the questions you have either through the AgriLinks website um, or of course reaching out to the speakers directly. I'm sure they'd be happy to engage uh, with all of you on your further questions and comments. All right. Well, I think I'm not seeing um, any other questions come in. And we've had some great engagement today in the webinar, so I think uh, perhaps we should go ahead and, and bring it to a close. So I would like to thank our excellent lineup of speakers uh, for some very interesting presentations and some great useful resources. Um, and most importantly, I would like to thank our attendees. Uh, you are the reason that we continue to hold AgriLinks webinars um, on behalf of Feed the Future and the Bureau for Food Security. So thank you very, very much for attending, for asking your questions. Um, or engaging, letting us know what you're hearing. And we hope to see you at uh, future webinars and around the uh, civil society engagement uh, topic and circles. We'll keep talking about this. All right, so we will sign off um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>